Okay, well, thank you uh, for inviting me to speak here at this conference. Okay, first, maybe I'll uh, erase the board. Um, so, so today I want to tell you... Uh, <laughs> okay, so today I'm going to tell you about some non-perturbative aspects of reconstruction of bulk operators, meaning trying to write operators in the bulk in terms of operators of the dual CFT. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, and, and part of the thing I want to emphasize today is that when trying to write operators in the bulk in, in a way that makes sense non-perturbatively, and of course I always still want to work in the low energy effective theory when I talk about operators in the bulk, um, but they might be states that are very different from the ground state. Uh, or states that are very different from each other, different semi-classically in the bulk language. Uh, so one of the things I want to uh, convey is that the constraints of diffeomorphism invariance have some subtle aspects that can change the qualitative picture of how, well, how these operators can be represented in the CFT, and, uh, and I think it will resolve some issues that otherwise looked paradoxical or, or kind of a contradiction between the bulk and the boundary. So let me first start by saying exactly what I mean by bulk reconstruction. And there are two, two kinds, two, two main methods of bulk reconstruction. I'll write one of them on this blackboard and one of them over there. And then I'll uh, tell you some, some things that look like paradoxes that we all know uh, just to set the stage. And then I'll uh, try to explain how features that we all know are there from the CFT dual, how we can also see them in the bulk so that it won't look like a contradiction. Okay, so, so one kind of reconstruction we might call causal reconstruction. And this is the, the oldest one. And the idea here is I have ADS and I want to describe some bulk operator that sits somewhere in the interior of ADS. And I imagine I have a s dual CFT, and I, if, if I solve the bulk theory, then I can try to evolve this operator out to the boundary using the bulk Heisenberg equations. But in order to do that, I needed to solve the bulk theory. So it doesn't seem, although I can try to find such a formula, and one can indeed find such formulas, it seems not completely satisfying just in itself because it didn't look like it followed from a CFT principle. You had to extract the bulk Lagrangian first, solve the bulk theory, and then get an expression. And so one ends up with formulas that write this operator in terms of some things that are space-like or also null or time-like related to this point on the boundary. So some operator smeared in time and space in the CFT, some non-local operator. So we typically get expressions that look like some kernel like this, where this labels a point in the bulk and y is a point on the boundary, things like that. And then there are many corrections if we go to higher orders. Okay, so that's the idea of causal reconstruction. And I'll come back to some uh, more aspects about it in, in just a minute. And then a, a totally or a very different sounding idea we might call entanglement reconstruction. And this is a little bit, this entanglement reconstruction, you can try to apply in situations where you might have a problem with that, because if I have causal horizons in the bulk, that procedure isn't going to work, because I won't be able to evolve the operator out. So if I have you know, some typical state of a black hole that I don't even know how I formed it from collapse, maybe that happened an extremely long time ago, and I want an operator behind the horizon of that black hole, I won't really know what to do here. On, on the other hand, with, with this uh, method of entanglement reconstruction, I try to do something different. So let me just describe the basic philosophy of this idea uh, in, in, a way that, in a way that I think is the most simple, although different people have written various formulae of this type. So the way I want to describe it is based on something called the, the Riesz-Leiter theorem. So again, here's my picture of the ADS bulk. And then I look at the algebra of operators near the boundary, some region like this. Let me call that set of operators A. So those are supposed to be bulk operators. 
that are near the boundary or at the boundary uh, all at one time or within a short time range. Unlike over there where we had to take operators extended for a very long time range if the bulk operator we wanted was deep inside. So this can be for some short time range. Now, if we work in bulk perturbation theory around a particular configuration, then this algebra acting on the bulk state which we imagine is something like the vacuum in whatever geometry the state is dual to, this thing is supposed to be dense in the bulk Hilbert space. So in a sense, this guy gets me all of the bulk states. At least in the subspace of perturbation theory around this state. Okay, so that's the content of this rich lighter theorem, that if I take any, any algebra of operators in any region and act it on the vacuum, I generate the entire Hilbert space. And so then from this, I can construct to construct an operator just by writing its matrix elements. And so if I have a general operator, I can produce, in this way I can produce any state. And so then here I get some other state, or the dagger of another state, this gives me, in principle, arbitrary matrix elements, and so if I sum things like this over I, then I should be able to get any operator, at least in this perturbative regime, yeah. No, so, so of course, the algebra A doesn't contain every operator, but this kind of expression gives you every operator. That's the statement. Because I'm explicitly constructing an arbitrary operator just by writing matrix elements. So if I can get every state with the, the, if this is an arbitrary state, then clearly these give me arbitrary operators. But that doesn't mean that A gives me arbitrary operators. I need an extra ingredient, which is this projector, yeah? Right, they're not, uh, they're n the, the algebra A is in some special region, which is here, the region at the boundary. So that's why, that's why the, it doesn't act in the bulk, the A's are the boundary operators. Like the bulk operators near the boundary or at the boundary. Right, that, that's why it's supposed to give a formula for bulk operators in terms of boundary ones. Yes, yeah, so of course, if A were the bulk operators, the statement would, would be trivial, I'll just have the operators already. You're, you're talking about how I would construct this projector or something else? Maybe say it again, I think I didn't quite catch it. Yes, that's, that's true. But no, 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 of course, of course, that's that. No, 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 that's right, but, but I mean, I, I, the idea of bulk reconstruction here is to, th this and that both apply in perturbation theory around the vacuum where you might as, where, where you sort of assume, as you pretend as if gravity is quantum field theory in the bulk, right? That's sort of the pretense of all, both of these reconstructions. Yeah. Okay, so, and then I'm gonna talk in a little bit about some non-perturbative non aspects. Um, yeah. Quick question, wouldn't this still work if you just keep going against this ball and this ball on the cap? Yes, like, sure. So I mean, just copy it. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Right, that, that, well, that's, that, that, that's true. I mean, you need to know, you, you, you need to know what, what operator you want to construct. That's true. So both of them, 
in both sides, you need to know, in both sides, you have, need to have solved the bulk theory. The, for that, on that point, there's no distinction. Yeah. But both sides require you to have solved the bulk theory. But part of my point might be that this, I, well, it's not clear whether this question is the right question. In fact, maybe by the end of the talk, you'll feel even more that it's not the right question. But I think we used to think that if we could write the bulk operators in terms of CFT operators, then we will have understood how the bulk works. Maybe we could ask the question more generally. How do you describe the physics in the bulk if somebody, it, suppose you know everything about the CFT, how do you understand what happens in the bulk? So if operators like this, if there was a scheme to do this, that would tell you the answer. But maybe this isn't the right approach. In fact, in some sense, I'll tell you that it's not for some pretty sharp or some sharper reason. Okay, so th this was the idea over here. Um, to, so again, uh, you have to know the operator you want in terms of states, so that means you probably also solve the bulk theory, and then you can try to con reconstruct it like this using this projector together with boundary operators. Um, well, but this projector is some extra object, which, depending on the situation, may or may not look like a boundary operator. So in the case of the vacuum, we might obtain this projector by something like e to the minus a very large number times the Hamiltonian. So that's the projector on the vacuum. And this we can actually write as a boundary operator because the Hamiltonian is an integral of t0,0 on the boundary. So that's where gravity would come into the story in that situation. And you could try to construct this projector in other ways. But this trick won't work very well if I have some generic state here, not the vacuum. So this is sort of bulk reconstruction to, from the algebra together with an extra ingredient that somebody has to give you. Well, obviously, in principle, the projector on the state is a CFT operator, but it's not a straightforward expression in general. Okay. Okay, so th th those are some of the basic methods. And then there are certain situations where we where we're all familiar with the, you know, the black hole information paradox that seems to obstruct this idea, right? So it says that something that you do in the bulk analysis seems to give a contradictory answer to what you would have gotten in the boundary analysis. And I'm gonna talk about some particular version of that actually due to Marlton Wall, uh, Aaron Wall, who's here in the audience. and. And th things will be somewhat easier to understand in that case than in the case of a single black hole, like a pure state black hole. So this is a version of, sort of a version of the information paradox in the eternal black hole. So we have on the bulk side some picture like this, which is the eternal ADS black hole, and the dual state is this thermofield double state at some temperature. And, and this paradox is very easy to state. It, it just says the following, or I'll, I, I'm gonna describe it in terms of operators, but you might say it in various different ways. At the level of operators, you would say, suppose I talk about some operator that could be behind the horizon. Now, if I want to make sure that this makes sense, as the operator in gravity, I have to tell you how to make a diffeomorphism invariant, and that's gonna be a key aspect in the whole business today. But to start with, we can say the usual words, but I would, the main point is that there's some subtlety with these words. So we start at some point on the boundary, and then we go in some distance, z in the radial direction, let's say along a space like geodesic, which is transverse to the boundary. That's sort of a very simple way of marking a point in the interior. And then we try to pick out the field operator there. So we should have done that also in the two boards on the side, otherwise we didn't even know what we were talking about by the operator in the bulk. So if I write down something like that, then it seems to be a puzzle because if I took my CFT in a state like this, which is completely factorized, and this operator is framed to the right boundary, it seems almost tautological that it has to be pure right operator because the left system just has nothing to do with the story, right? Um, 
the Hamiltonian is the sum of left and right. There's no interaction and there's no entanglement in the state. So the left system just doesn't seem to have anything to do with it. So we would have thought that this was a pure right operator if it was framed to the right. Oh, you're all still here. Um, I, I think it, well, uh, what I want to say is that there are, what I'm ultimately going to say, what I ultimately want to say is that there is some subtlety in defining the operator from the bulk side, and depending on what you meant by the operator, it might have been pure right or not. And that's exactly what we would have said from the CFT also. But I, I just, but, but the, the main thing I want to say today or explain is what is that subtlety in the bulk that makes it have that same feature? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, so, uh, right, right. So the idea, the, 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 the statement that you would expect a pure right operator is in factorized things, not in the black hole. The, the statement that you would have thought this would be a pure right operator from the bulk analysis is in factorized things, not, not in the black hole. Oh, uh, so in factorized states, then in the bulk, you would have thought it was a pure right operator. W whereas in the black hole, certainly not, because if I go behind the horizon, you can shoot me from the left, right? Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, ass I'm assuming the product state looks, has a dual that looks like this, and there's something here and something here, and they may or may not be black holes, or I have no idea what they are. Yeah. But whatever they are, th this operator doesn't go into this side. Th that would be, so th that seems to follow from the duality applied to the two sides separately. Let's put it in this way. All, all I'm trying to say is that if you think that entanglement is dual to the connectedness of geometry, then this thing would be disconnected and this one would be connected. And if it's disconnected, then the operator would be right operator. If it's connected, it wouldn't be. So that was all I meant to say. And you might, one might have thought, l let me phrase it in that way, okay? One might have thought that that leads to some kind of contradiction because entanglement is not a linear property, right? So how can it be that a property of space, namely the connectedness of space, or whether, you know, is dual to something which is not an operator, which is whether the state is entangled. And, okay, so that, that, that's sort of, the, that's the more basic paradox, okay? So the more basic paradox is if we really believe that factorized states are dual to disconnected geometries, and entangled states are dual to connected geometries, that seems to contradict something about the CFT, right? In other words, let, let's say we define an operator which is the connectedness of space operator. So in this situation, we'd say it has a value of two because there are two disconnect, two components of space. And over here, we would say it has the value one. And that's not possible for a linear operator because this state and these states aren't orthogonal. Okay, so that's the general, that's the general idea. Yeah. Do you want it to be a nonlinear operator? Well, okay. Uh, I think the question is the following. Well, if we believe that this state is dual to this, and if we think that these states are dual to that, then either there is some breakdown in the bulk description at some point, or the number of connected components of space is not a good operator. And if you, we say that it is not, and so it's certainly not a good operator in the CFT. It's not a matrix acting in the CFT. And the question is, does that contradict the bulk description? Because naively, you would have thought that the number of components of space is a well-defined diffeomorphism invariant physical question, which in the bulk you would assign to an operator. 
So either you throw out quantum mechanics and you say that the relation between the bulk low energy description and the CFT is changes the rules of quantum mechanics so that operators of the bulk theory map to nonlinear things in the CFT, or you say that the range of validity of the bulk description is much reduced, then you can also evade this in a way that I'll describe in a second. But, but I want to give you a third option today. And the third option is gonna be that this operator sh wasn't supposed to exist in the bulk either. Okay, so sh sure, in that sense, it's a little bit like a straw man argument, but it's not immediately apparent why this operator shouldn't exist in the bulk. So that's the thing that I want to try to explain. If there's no way to explain why the operator doesn't exist in the bulk language, it's a contradiction with the bulk language. And it means that the bulk description breaks down in some form, or if you don't believe it breaks down, it means that you've violated the rules of quantum mechanics. So, but the point is that there will be a bulk explanation for why the operator doesn't exist. That's the idea. Well, these aren't just two states, so let me get to that in a second. There, there are many states of both types, so. Right, because there are too many states. I mean, this span the whole Hilbert space. Well, uh, maybe that's an additional alternative, or uh, but I mean that you, you, you might take the different operators that I'll describe. I, I might say the different super selection sectors that you talked about, it's maybe better to think of them as different choices of gauge rather than as different theories or dictionaries. Or to say it differently, in order to talk about the things in the bulk, you have to define, you, 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 I mean, once you realize there's a subtlety in the definition of the operator in the bulk, you have to fix it, and then once you fix it, the problem goes away, so you don't, so, okay, so then we don't need to, then we don't need to guess what the answer might be. Anyway. Um, but indeed has a similar flavor to that, in the sense that sometimes, you might use one operator and sometimes another, but, but, but you should think of them as the, a choice of gauge. Th that's what I want to try to say. Ah, right, right. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I, I, would, I would actually take the opposite point of view. When, usually when we have something defined along a time-like trajectory, it's not an operator in Hilbert space, right? Like a time-like Wilson line, it's not an operator that changes the Hilbert space. So it's true that that defines an operational procedure, but in the case of operational procedure, it's not so obvious to, to me that the answer should be described by a linear operator to begin with, or perhaps, Right, so I, I would say that's the f that is the other side of the story, which is if you actually jump into the bulk and make measurements, what, are we, what is one actually doing? And I, I think one is not measuring any operator. But m maybe we should have known that already because there aren't any, you see, when, when I actually jump into the bulk and measure something, so when I do a physical measurement, right, I can, I have some apparatus and some system, and then I interact them with some interaction Hamiltonian that I could write like this. Operator of a system times an operator of the apparatus, and, and usually they're supposed to commute and they're both commission, and that gives me my Hamiltonian. And, and then there are decoherence processes in the apparatus, and the effect is that I get eigen projection on the operator all system because the density matrix gets approximately diagonal in that that basis because the decoherence is communicated to the system by this interaction. But you could imagine something 
else, like even in electromagnetism, we could write the following operator. We could have some charged operator in the system connected by a Wilson line between the system and the apparatus to something with the opposite charge in the apparatus. And that's a perfectly well-defined, also localized operator. Um, but if I have this interaction Hamiltonian, it's not very clear what you would say, what is the linear operator you say that you measured? Because how do I split this into a product of two gauge invariant operators? So there are many ways of doing it. So I could write, take this Wilson line and cut it and take it out to infinity, something like this. So I mean, originally I had a system and an apparatus connected by a Wilson line, that made the whole thing gauge invariant. And now I'm cutting this and pulling it out to infinity and coming back in some way to try to make it two separate things that are gauge invariant. And so then you might think, well, maybe, ma maybe we get eigen projection on this operator. But there, there are two problems with that statement. I mean, one of them is that it's not unique. There are lots of ways I can take it to infinity and those are all different operators. So which one am I supposed to say it is? But also they're all wrong because in the actual dynamics with this Hamiltonian, this, is this Hamiltonian is localized in this region. So in particular, it commutes with the electric field far away. But I can projection on, but this operator doesn't. And so I can just measure far away the fact that the evolution in this Hamiltonian doesn't look like eigen projection on this operator. So I can tell that it wasn't correctly described by the Born rule, basically. Now, in electromagnetism, we don't think, we don't have this problem because we just don't call this interaction a measurement. It's an exchange of an electron between the system and the apparatus, and the answer isn't written in the form of a number. So if I, in a, in a measurement, I write the answer in the form of a number in a notebook, and the operation of writing the answer in the notebook is supposed to be the O apparatus, if you like, ultimately. And I can treat everything else as a system, and that guy is clearly gauge invariant. But in gravity, there aren't any localized diffeomorphism invariant operators at all. So we always, so the, the, the person you send in the spaceship who makes a measurement, it's something like this. And so it's not so obvious how to relate that to an operator measurement. So, so instead, Right, so indeed, you, that, that's how you phrase your, the, the paradox. And I think at, at, at that level, it still stands as a puzzle, but maybe the answer is we wouldn't expect that to be described by an operator a priori for this reason. But, but, but instead, uh, but, but, but today I want to focus on this bulk reconstruction thing, which is all about trying to make operators and, and seeing what, uh, what are the issues of those operators. Okay, so, so one, one, one thing you might try to do to ameliorate this problem, which doesn't work, is to allow some small corrections to the two sides. And, and so the idea would be that, well, perhaps on this, this state, this operator has an eigenvalue which is very close to one, and on you know, the factorized vacuum, it's very close to two, but on you know, some other states here, it starts to differ from one by a little bit, and perhaps on some factorized states which involve, you know, very high energy guys here whose descriptions we might not understand as well, it starts to differ from two, and in the end it can all work. But that, that potential, potential resolution, which is a little bit like asking for some off-diagonal elements, I think that's the same idea. Uh, th th that doesn't work because there are too many states for which you know if you, there are too many states which the uh, bulk description is supposed to be valid on which the values of this operators disagree. And in particular, I can generate a large class of states of this type by evolving this in time. So uh, I call this a thermal field double state if I act on it with you know, the sum of the Hamiltonians or just the left Hamiltonian, it doesn't matter because the difference of the Hamiltonian annihilates the state. This thing gives me some other state. And in the bulk description, this looks like an extremely innocent operation because it's a pure boundary diffeomorphism. I simply redefine the location of t equals zero on the left boundary and 
Now, of course, we could imagine that the bulk description breaks down at some value of this time t. So if you allow that, then you can resolve this paradox in the way I just described. So if I say that the bulk description of the connected geometry is only valid for some not too long range of t, then there's no problem with linearity of, say, this connectedness operator. I have a very special state on which it has an eigenvalue of one, and on almost every other state, it has the eigenvalue of two. And so then on typical factorized states, I'll get two. So that would be perfectly fine, but it would say that the domain of validity of the bulk theory is much smaller than you expected. I, I would say that's like the firewall resolution of this business. After some time evolution, the bulk description is simply wrong. The naive bulk description is wrong, and it, the geometry looks disconnected. So, you know, we just put some cut that opens up here. But in this case, that seems more peculiar than for a pure state black hole because the, in the bulk side, because this time evolution just looks like changing the location of t equals zero on the left boundary, which doesn't seem to do anything. So, okay, but if the bulk is just wrong, then that could be fine. That, 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 that's true, it gives states of this type only. But, but we can, I mean, that's already enough to have this problem because in these kind of states, we think that this eigenvalue should be two, right? So that's, that's sufficient. And if you wanted to get other states, we can try acting on this thing with various operators on the left. And even by acting with simple operators and then evolving for a long time, we will get very generic states. So both sides get a big chunk of the Hilbert space, although neither side, as long as I stick to low, as, I, as long as I, so of course, if I start talking about states whose bulk duals go outside the domain of validity of the low energy bulk theory, then I will not have contradictions. I'll just won't say anything about them from the bulk side. So if I have a state here which has you know, some string sitting there, I will not use Einstein gravity to describe it. It will not make sense. But so the set of states of this type and of this type, which are described semi-classically in the bulk, are not of the whole Hilbert space, but they are both large enough subsets that this problem, you can't eliminate this contradiction by that. You have to say there's a more limited domain of validity of the bulk theory in order to take that route. What's the time zero of the description? Sorry? Well, in order to really show you have a contradiction, I have to take a very, a qu quite a long time evolution so that I get things which start to have significant overlaps with the uh, factorized states. So I need some exponentially long time evolution. But, so it's a very long time evolution, so perhaps, so, it, you know, it's like after black hole is half evaporated, that kind of time scale. So it's similar, in, again, to the firewall time scales, potentially. Okay, okay, so that was the story over there. Now, okay, so that, that, that I hope, set, set the stage, and now I want to describe how there is something more subtle in defining bulk operators. If we insist, if we actually want to talk about things that are supposed to be operators from the bulk point of view, so that they act on bulk states, there's something, some subtlety in defining them, and it will just match with the, what, once one takes that subtlety into account, it just matches with the behavior on the boundary, so then the puzzle goes away. And, and, and so, well, I hope I can convince you of that. M maybe before I say that, let me just say uh, two other things in, of, of a general nature about these reconstruction formulas. So this one, so both of them, as we said, you need to have solved the bulk theory, so they don't look like very intrinsic mechanisms from the CFT point of view, but maybe that's okay. If we just want to know the answer and not know why it's the right answer. But on this side, there's a further issue, which is that because it invo evol involves the boundary operators at different times, it depends on 
knowing what the boundary Hamiltonian is in the future or in the past. So in particular, if I take the same system and I couple it to sources, time-dependent sources, if I use this methodology, I will be forced to modify the expression for the definition of the bulk operators. So for that reason, it, so that is not what we normally do, right? Usually if we have quantum system or classical system, which is described in some terms of some dynamical variables, the definition of what the variable corresponds to what doesn't depend on whether we couple it to something else in the past or in the future. That's against the rules. And, and, and so perhaps we should regard, have regarded this operator as, as more, of, more of boundary precursors than of honest things in the bulk. And from that point of view, this entanglement method is better. Uh, the entanglement method is, only involves things at t equals zero. You don't have to know whether you turned on sources in the future in order to get formulas of this type. So it's perhaps preferable for that reason. But it explicitly involves this projector onto the state. So if I did perturbation theory around a different state, I will use a different formula in a way which is not linear in, in, in general. So this thing, th this method, if I really try to use it non-perturbatively, also violates the rules in a different way. So there's something a little suspicious about both of those, both of those proposals for how to describe the bulk operators in terms of CFT operators. And that's probably a good thing because otherwise you drive these things as a contradiction. Th then you would turn this argument into sort of a pure contradiction if there wasn't something suspicious about the left and the right hand boards. Okay, now, but I want to try to argue that a lot of the subtlety here is to do with is to do with diffeomorphism invariance. Um, oh, m yeah, maybe just to say one other th thing to make that, to also make that point. If we had a, not, if we were not in the thermo, not in the eternal black hole or the two-sided black hole, if we're just in a single black hole that was a pure state, then in some ways the black hole information paradox there, you could also phrase it as being about the fact that in the bulk description there seem to be too many states. So there, um, you know, here the problem is because there are overlaps, non-zero overlaps between states that in the bulk description seem like they should be orthogonal, right? It seems that these states should not have big overlaps with these states. Similarly, even these states among themselves have too large of an overlap. So if I call this state, you know, let me put some capital T, I've called this state T, if I look at the overlap between two different T's, then if we think of them as semi-classical coherent states, which they certainly appear to be, you would have thought that this overlap decayed as some Gaussian, something like this, with some rate. But that's not correct. You could just compute the overlap explicitly. At when the time difference becomes very large, it's like adding up an expression like this with random phases, and they mostly cancel except for the low energy bits. And so it actually saturates at a value that's about one over the thermal partition function, which is some value of order e to the minus s, where s is the entropy of the black hole. So that's a tiny number, but it, it's not going to zero in this way. So the whole problem here is that the states, which in the bulk seem like they should be very different, essentially either exactly orthogonal or very close to orthogonal, aren't when we see how they're represented in the CFT. But what I want to explain is the bulk reason for why they're not orthogonal, is another way of saying it. And, you know, in the single-sided black hole, we can think of the information paradox in a similar language. And actually, in that case, of course, we know that the Hilbert space inside and outside the black, the Hilbert space doesn't factorize into inside and outside of a black hole. If we have a, you know, black, pure state black hole, so this is a s separate from the other discussion. So let's say we have a black hole in a pure state. If we, th there is not a factorization in terms of outside of the horizon tensor inside, we, we know that. Of course, they don't even have a factorization in ordinary QFT in the continuum, exactly. But 
to how much does it not factorize? So in the gravity case, there's also the diffeomorphism constraints. Well, the way to gauge how much, so it's, so clearly the actual Hilbert space is not a tensor product, but some kind of projection of that, or a subspace of it, which imposes the gauge conditions. So the way to judge how much does it factorize is to ask how big is the algebra of operators that act only on the inside? But although in perturbation theory around a given configuration, we might think there's a significant such algebra in the gravitational case, at least naively, we just think, oh, there's a lot of space behind the horizon. But if you insist on making operators that are actually non-perturbatively diffeomorphism invariant, we usually think there aren't any that act only within a region. So we would say that the purely interior algebra is null, uh, empty. That seems very consistent with complementarity, right? Everything inside is really outside. That would also explain why you have the large overlaps, but the, the fact that there aren't any non-perturbatively well-defined diffeomorphism invariant bulk operators here is a bulk statement, right? We knew that from some bulk reasoning. So if we could make that reasoning more precise, we would seem to have a bulk explanation for it. Now, I don't know how to do that here, but that's essentially what's possible to at least to get closer to doing that in this two-sided situation. That's the idea. Okay, so of course one way to try to, so the whole, so now the, the, the main hero will be the imposing the diffeomorphism constraints correctly and the main point will, right. So, so of course one way to try to do that is if there was a non-perturbatively good gauge. Then we could just work in that gauge and everything will be easy. So if, you know, Pfefferman Gram gauge was a non-perturbatively good gauge, we would just use that. That will correspond to these operators where we go along space like geodesics that are transverse from the boundary. But that, that gauge is not a good gauge. It's not a gauge it, because you'll develop caustics in the interior. So you can't say that you work in this gauge. Moreover, when I'm in a situation like this where I have two asymptotic boundaries and I am allowing myself to consider both disconnected and connected geometries, it's not possible that there can be a gauge condition which is a good gauge in both situations because the group of diffeomorphisms is different in the two setups. So the number of things I have to gauge fix isn't the same, so it doesn't make sense to say, to, to write an equation that will work in both. So that's the really deep problem. Uh, the problem of Pfefferman-Gram coordinates is we could try to find some better coordinates or something. Um, but, but nothing can ever work in both the connected and disconnected sides. Now, in, in, instead of trying to come up with a complicated gauge, and after all, t the whole story of this bulk reconstruction, obviously we need to write the operators in a gauge or define them in a diffeomorphism invariant way, which is the same thing, but th that's something quite ugly in general, right? And it's a pure bulk thing. So maybe it's nicer just uh, as a point of principle to try to not fix the gauge for as long as possible. And so in instead one can use something more like this hartle hawking formalism. And so the idea is instead of fixing a gauge, I write a overcomplete set of states and they are in the gauge invariant Hilbert space and they have lots of overlaps between them, but I can compute what they are. And then diffeomorphism invariant operators have to be consistent with their overlaps. So that's, that's the idea of this Hartle-Hawking method of gauge fixing. Of course, one part of this Hartle-Hawking formalism is that it looks like I'm writing a wave functional. So you write some functional of the spatial metric, that's your state. So it's like working in field basis. Th that's not the part that I care about. Right. I, I, the part I care about is the way it treats the constraints, in particular the, the Hamiltonian constraints, the constraints to do with temporal diffeomorphisms. Uh, of course, if, if because I only know the bulk gravity theory in perturbation theory and at low energies, well, I only know the bulk gravitational theory as a long distance effective theory anyhow, which means only in the regime when it's weakly coupled. I don't actually lose anything by writing the states in this wave functional basis because I will be outside the domain of validity of my theory. We don't know how to do the bulk calculations when we will need to use something more complicated than just the wave functional of the naive field anyhow. 
So it, the discussion is non-perturbative, but it's still a discussion in perturbation theory around configurations which are well described by the low energy effective theory. But there are many such configurations that are not related to each other, obviously, by small perturbations. Okay, so the way that Hartle and Hawking define this thing is they, uh, uh, well, well, we'll put their story into ADS. It's actually a little nicer in ADS. So we, we imagine we have some cap here. This is supposed to be the boundary of ADS, Euclidean boundary of ADS, and maybe I turn on some Euclidean sources. If these Euclidean sources are real, I will produce some uh, configuration here where its Lorentzian continuation has a T goes to minus T symmetry. So that's slightly special. If I wanted to get more states, I might try to evolve these in Lorentzian time. But let's just focus on these because they're simpler. And then on the spatial, on the time slice here, I put this metric H, that's the intrinsic metric. And I integrate over the metrics in the bulk, subject to this asymptotic condition and this metric on the slice. So the, in particular, I, if I write the metric near the slice, I have you know some dt squared times the times the lapse, and then I have the space-time parts multiplied by the shift, and then I have this metric h. And because the lapse and the shift don't appear with any time derivatives, it's natural to integrate over them. Well, in particular, I want to pick boundary conditions here so that the Euclidean path integral will at least generically or by counting the number of functions be dominated by some Euclidean saddle rather than if I fix the lapse and the shift, I will typically not find any saddle. Okay, so, so that's what Hardin and Hawking do. And, and so we, I want to think of this wave function as a map from the Hilbert space of gauge invariant states, which are well described by the bulk theory into numbers, well, in general complex numbers because the typical state here will be a linear combination of sources of this type with complex coefficients. But I, I do that after the fact, uh, if I like to make things simpler. And so therefore, I can think of this object as the overlap of some basis state with my state psi. But I shouldn't have called it a basis state because the whole point is that the states labeled by different h are not orthogonal. That's the way that diffeomorphism invariants, in particular the temporal diffeomorphisms, uh -huh, are, are implemented here. And, and so the overlap between two of these can be computed by some Euclidean path integral, something like that, and they're typically not zero. And if I, e even, uh, even infinitesimally, there's something, because the Hamiltonian constraint equation is, uh, I, I mean, it, it's a local symmetry. And so infinitesimally, what I mean by infinitesimally is if I look at one h and an h prime, which is close to the original h. Of course, there's a trivial issue about the spatial diffeomorphisms. Th that's not the, of interest here. We think of this as the spatial diffeomorphism class of h. And in ADS, that means subject to the ADS boundary conditions and so on. Um, the, 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 the main character here is the temporal diffeomorphism. That, that's what the whole point is about. And so, so, so infinitesimally, there are lots of overlaps, and that tells you that the data psi of h is redundant, and in particular, it satisfies the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. So there is some local Hamiltonian constraint operator, the infinite number of such, in a sense, one for each point, or I can integrate it against some test function, and that has to annihilate this wave function. That's just saying that the H's that appear there are not linearly independent. But there are also non-perturbative overlaps. So the H associated to connected and a disconnected geometry also have some non-zero overlap of the same type. And so in a formalism like this, if I want to define a diffeomorphism invariant operator, I have to make sure that it commutes with the constraints so that it doesn't, in other words, I can't act on all H of psi of h is independently, it doesn't make sense because I won't get a psi, a new psi that actually came from anything that made sense because the h's aren't independent. And so in the same way, I have to make sure that it respects any non-perturbative overlaps. And the reason why that's like an independent thing to check is that it's 
not possible in the low energy effective theory to integrate up the infinitesimal constraint to get to non-perturbative ones, because at some point you have to break the slice if you want to change its topology. And in doing that, you will always go through some regime of very high curvature where the low energy description breaks down. So y you won't expect by studying this to learn the exact linear relation between the states. You won't be able to invert the matrix of overlaps to find the, to find the good orthonormal basis. That will be cutoff dependent if I did this explicitly in a low energy theory with some finite cutoff below the Planck scale. So that, that linear relation will depend on the cutoff. But if I had the exact theory, I could do that, but we, that's not the story here. Um, but I can still check whether some operator has some infrared problem or not. And so th this operator that measures the number of connected components is clearly bad because it has a different value on eigens on the cats that aren't orthogonal. So it doesn't commute with the non-perturbative constraints. Okay, so it doesn't exist from the bulk point of view. So there's no contradiction. It wasn't supposed to be there. But now what about these operators where you shoot in the spatial geodesic? Well, those sounded okay, right? Um, certainly they make sense in classical GR. That you can also insert them into Euclidean path integral and get some answer, uh, off-shell Euclidean path integral, but they, they, they don't give you, without saying something extra, an operator that actually acts on states. And that's because the relation, in order to get an operator, if we think of, say, the insertion into the path integral, to get an operator, we, you, you need, you need the thing that you insert to be on the time slice, right? Operators act at a given time. You know, if I have a time like Wilson line, right, it's perfectly well-defined in the path integral, but it doesn't give me an operator, it changes the Hilbert space. So you want to make sure that this isn't like that. Now, if I use this definition, I just fail right away, because if I try to insert into this path integral, the thing with the geodesic, it will usually just hit the edge, and it will hit the edge before the geodesic is supposed to end. It just exits the manifold that's in this path integral and I don't even have a definition. So that, that makes no sense. But instead I need to gauge fix a little bit, right? So that, that's kind of a completely ungauge fix story. I can gauge fix a little bit by demanding that I sit in Pfefferman Gram gauge along the pink line. It's a little bit like demanding that the geodesic of interest sits in the slice so that it acts as an operator at a given time. So I do this, so now I restrict the path integral over the H so that the integral over the Z lapse is set to zero along this line. And I probably also restrict this metric spatially to be of the Pfeffer and Graham form there. So then if I do that, it makes sense. So this is a new set of cats, so I might call them H gauge fixed or H Pfeffer and Graham. Uh, but it's Pfeffer and Graham gauge along only one geodesic so that it's not the bad choice to make. I couldn't pick Pfefferman Gram gauge along every geodesic because it has caustics. But I don't usually get caustics along one geodesic. But there are, there are two situations. So in Euclidean path integral, the only way I would get a caustic is if this line is self-intersecting, self which seems very non-generic. But once I start to go to Lorentz signature, I analytically continue past that self-intersection. And then there is a situation where a space like geodesic can come around. This is not a very good picture, but it's supposed to go around in space and then become time-like to itself. So I can have non-achronal space-like lines. And in this situation, I wouldn't actually have known what I meant by this operator to begin with, because it has some operator, order operator ordering ambiguity between the earlier part and the later part. So perhaps it's good that I define the operator to act on states which aren't of this type, so I just throw them out. But then this also fixes the other issue because by definition, this operator acts at a given time. And so in particular, the definition of these states on which I'm specifying the, this operator, uh, those cat states always have this entire space like geodesic on the same time slice as t equals zero of both boundaries. So here's the other boundary. So there has to be, so if it's the space time is disconnected, that constraint does nothing. But if it's connected, it's an untrivial condition. And I needed that in order to define the thing as an operator. Otherwise, it wouldn't have acted on states. And 
this operator is, with this definition, is the guy that corresponds to the Euclidean path integral insertion. You can always cut the Euclidean path integral into two halves, which, where the cut contains this geodesic. That's never a problem. But in Lorentz signature, this operator just sees the firewall, right? So if I start to evolve in time, evolution in time I can represent as just shifting the t equals zero locus of the left. So this operator comes from here, it goes behind the horizon, and, or even into the left wedge, it doesn't really matter. And then as I evolve the left guy back, or I, as I evolve this side forward in time, I can draw it as shifting this back, just easy to draw. At some point, this becomes uh, causally connected. And, and then the slice condition implies that I have to pick so as I, as I evolve back in time the, time, the spatial slice that this gauge is choosing is one which contains this geodesic and then goes like that. And so this gets, I get higher and higher curvatures in the slices until eventually I exit the domain of validity of the low energy theory and that happens just as this will become time-like related. And it's actually at the point where this is time-like related that I first start to see significant uh, non-zero commutation relations between this operator and simple operators on the left, like the bulk operators, the bulk field operator on the left. So like, instead of thinking th of this as an operator back in time, I want to think of this as operator at t equals zero. This is a state where I, sh one of these time-shifted states. So this is the state that I called minus t, I think, before. So that's one of the states that I'm interested in, but then this operator clearly has a bad behavior. Okay, yeah, so I'll just wrap up. Um, so this operator goes bad on these states. It looks like it probes UV physics in the bulk, but that's entirely due to the gauge condition. And I can, of course, pick some different operator. In fact, in this case, it's pretty easy to guess what's the other operator that would have been nicer here. I just take the operator I defined this way which I'll call phi gauge fixed, and evolve it in time by the left Hamiltonian by this amount of time. So that's a different choice of this gauge. And in that choice of gauge, it's perfectly fine on this state, but it's bad on the other state. So that's a little bit like uh, state-dependent operators. But all of them correspond to different choices of gauge. So the gauge, it's really the gauge that breaks down not something intrinsic about the operator. And then you can also ask, how do you get the guys that actually looked like the pure right operators from the bulk language that didn't act on the left at all? And in order to do that, you, you need to factorize the Hilbert space in the bulk. And so I think the way to do it, I'll just finish with this. Um, th the way to do it is to try to, try to cut the bulk by putting in a little Euclidean path integral, sort of put, put some boundary, put some boundary in the interior and cut the bulk, wh which is what you need to do to define entanglement entropy and gravity, probably. I don't have time to explain this because uh, I took a lot longer than I thought I would, but um, if I define something like that, a little path Euclidean thing like that, this defines some map from the original Hilbert space to factorize Hilbert space, and then I can get factorized operators, like that is pure right operators. Okay, so that's the bulk description of how to get to the guys that just don't see the left at all. So all of them make sense, but they just correspond to doing something different in the bulk. And that's not a contradiction, it's just about implementing the constraints non-perturbatively. Okay, so that was the main point. And of course, this whole discussion is only about questions about operators, things that actually act on the states that we can construct as diffeomorphism invariant operators in the bulk Hilbert space, and then we seem to get agreement with the CFT. But there's also this question of like physical measurements, if we send in a guy from the boundary and he measures something, and, but I don't know what that corresponds to. So that's the end, thanks.